Shall we start then? When you're ready. Let me give a quick introduction. <coughs> um, back in 2003, the NLUUG gave Guido van Rossum an award, the NLUUG award. And um, with privilege comes uh, the need to actually indulge in some requests. So I sent Guido an email two years ago, just after he resigned from being the dictator, the benevolent dictator for life, asking him, would you be so kind to present for us uh, life after dictatorship? And he replied, well, I would like to do that, but um, I'm retired now, so uh, I'm very busy. You should understand that retirement is not easy. Uh, but do contact me in one and a half years, and maybe I have time then. So a few months ago, I sent him an email. And hours after sending this email, I read a press release by Microsoft that Guido has started working for Microsoft. And um, then the day after I got a reply saying, well, I would very much have liked to talk for you, but um, I'm very busy with my new job now. So uh, um, perhaps later. So I explained to him that I was very disappointed and that he could only uh, get away with this if he would point me out to the best person to talk about Python after the benevolent dictatorship for life. And um, the first name he pointed me to was Steve. So I found out where I could find Steve. Um, and I sent him an email saying that by personal recommendation of Guido, he had been pointed out as the best person to talk about this subject. And I asked him to give a presentation for us. And uh, he replied, and I was using LinkedIn, by the way. I thought if Guido works for Microsoft, then why not use their tooling to actually do this? <laughs> <laughs> um, and it took a while for us to, uh, uh, to, to find a date to do this. But today is the day and I'm very much looking forward to the presentation. So Steve, please enlighten us. Well, thank you very much, Kuhn, for that munificent introduction. I'll try not to be a disappointment, although it's hard to live up to words like that. As to enlightenment, well, I suppose you'll, you'll all have to make your own minds up after we've, we've been through the slides I've, I've prepared. Um, it's nice to know that I'm a I'm a substitute Guido, but uh, and I'll I'll use the anglicised pronunciation because Guido does not fall naturally on the English tongue, and uh, I can only make an approximation to the Dutch in the in the best cases. So, forgive me, I lived too long in in America, and everyone calls uh, Dr. Van Rossum Guido Guido over there. So, it's become a habit, and he doesn't personally mind; he's used to it. So anyway, yes, I'm, I'm not actually sure I am the best person to be talking about this subject since my relationship with Python is slightly different to, to that of a core developer. I'm not one of the people who actually uh, makes Python work. I'm, I suppose, at best one of the people who um, tries to bring around, if you like. So, um, yeah, let me get on to introduce myself briefly you've you've probably never heard of it, but I studied computational science when I was uh, at university a very very long time ago and I've been using Python since about 1995 I've rather than working a, a career in the corporate world I've been an independent consultant uh, most of the time but I've also been in training and education I taught computer science at Manchester University for a period I've organized conferences. I've done quite a few things. In fact, I've been doing things long enough that 
I'm planning to retire in the foreseeable future. Um, in terms of my involvement with Python, I was mentioning to committee members before the talk opened that uh, my own personal interest in object-oriented systems waned in the early 1970s when I came across the work of uh, Alan Kay's Smalltalk group. But it, it uh, sorry, waxed then, uh, but it very quickly waned when I actually got my hands on a Smalltalk implementation and find that the the language didn't in the in the Python parlance fit my brain. I didn't find it a natural way to express algorithms. So I kind of gave up on object orientation for a while. And in the 1990s, mid 1990s, almost by accident, uh, I'd heard of Python, but I, I came across a book on Python while I was uh, browsing a bookstore during a, a wait for a restaurant table. So I bought it. And I read it and I realized this was a, a fabulous way to express object-oriented systems that people would find quite natural. And so over the next couple of months, I, I decided, having uh, failed to take advantage of industry trends in the past, that um, I thought Python was such a winner, I was going to put 20 years into it and, and see what that did for me. It, it seemed like an interesting development. It was open source. Um, I'm fairly community-minded. so. I was uh, all pretty gung-ho to make Python work. So I've invested quite a lot of effort in Python one way and another as a director of the Python Software Foundation and indeed its chair. I inaugurated the PyCon conference, which has now been running, uh, what, 17 years and is still doing quite well, although I'm not quite sure how the virtual events do now. And so rather than being a, 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 a contributor to the language, I've been a contributor to the infrastructure around the language and focused on areas like making sure that Python had friendly communities in, in as many locales as possible, that the, uh, the mission of the foundation itself is to grow uh, a diverse international Python community. And basically, I focused on those aspects rather than the code, where there are, there are people who can, can do that kind of thing. Uh, much better than someone who's now been programming for so long there almost feel tired of it sometimes <clears throat> so anyway as I as, as my terminal uh, career decline continues I find myself working in a company called Labster which uh, is an interesting circle that round from my introduction to um, the world of employment after graduation when I worked for the computer-based learning unit in Manchester and the systems that we were teaching people with there were teletype based. So I now find myself working in the world of virtual reality. And you may or may not have seen a recent announcement. Apparently, we closed a C round with um, Andreessen Horowitz of $60 million, which is going to fund our next round of development. So it's uh, again, you know, the, the education theme in my uh, career, such as this is continues. So I thought tonight what we'd do is uh, I'd describe how Python's development came about and then um, the events that led up to Guido's determination to stop being the, the uh, benevolent dictator for life. And then a, a description of the, the process, how the community actually uh, made the decision to go forwards and just a, a summary of some of the early experience. But you should remember that I'm speaking um, as an outsider. I, I do follow the uh, the Python dev list, but I'm I'm not much of a contributor to it. And I think people generally feel able to ignore pretty much anything I say um, on the dev list. But uh, they're kind to me. So okay. Uh, with that said, excuse me a moment. Pause for a sip of water. So a quick look uh, into Python's history. So Guido van Rossum was working at CWI in the 1980s, and he was working on a language called ABC. Um, if anyone ever knew a language called Logo, which was uh, Seymour Papert's invention, I think, then uh, you will recognize the, the similarities that it has to Logo. But basically, it was intended to be a language that people who were unafraid to use computers but needed a language they could understand to express their intentions. Um, and its primary interesting feature in the Python context, I suppose, is that it's 
uh, it uses nesting by to by indentation to to indicate the block structure of the program and that's obviously a feature that people who know python will recognize there so that was was primarily aimed at literate computers uh, sorry literate computer literate non programmers but um van rossenfeld that it was probably a bit too cumbersome. It, it didn't have any object-oriented capabilities. Uh, it was just one big monolithic environment. It was a bit like the, the small talk virtual machine, which was a thing entirely into itself. There was no operating system. Everything was the virtual machine. And ABC was a little bit the same. So uh, in actual fact, the way you obtained uh, persistent storage in ABC was by storing things in global variables. And then when you terminated your ABC session, the global variables would be stored and brought back. So it had some, some pretty vile features. And as I've already said, in the Python world, we have a, a saying, you know, Python fits your brain. It, it's a natural way to express things. And uh, so ABC was, was definitely not something that fit Van Rossum's brain. So he started to work uh, almost as a hobby on a new design and and I saw an interview where he was asked you know why why did he invent python and he said if effectively he was working in a team um that was doing some things in c and some things in shell scripting and they found that you know just writing c programs for a one off task was was a very ineffective way to to do programming because c is not unless you've got a ready set of libraries for a particular application you, you're used to working on. It's not always easy to, to build a C program that just does something that a shell script does, but then shell scripts have all the problems of shell scripting, which is that the, you, know, you can loop and so on, but it doesn't really have any satisfactory data structures or, or namespaces. And the performance, of course, is quite abysmal because it's a, a heavily interpreted language. So anyway, despite the fact that ABC did have certain faults, um, Guido van Rossum recognized that it had many good features as well. And he, he incorporated those into his design for Python, which is something we should be grateful for, because I believe that's what made Python a really good language for uh, learners and people who didn't really want to use programming. Um, but they had to because without using a computer, they'd never get the answer to the problem they, they really wanted to solve. These are what I sometimes call the reluctant programmers of the world. And I often remind developers that uh, you've got to be careful because 90% of programmers aren't doing it because they want to do programming. They want doing it because they've got problems to solve that they can only solve by learning programming. So anyway, yes, another crucial decision that Van Rossum took was that he wanted it to be extensible right from the beginning so it was very easy to to modularize a python program by splitting it up into uh, modules which is the the basic source unit of the language but he also determined that he wanted compiled languages to be able to interface to the interpreter and that was something the, this play well with others philosophy was something that stood the language in in very good stead in its early days so <clears throat> back in Wow, February 1991, how long ago is that now? That's what, quick bit of arithmetic, uh, 21, 30 years, good heavens, really. Yes, so uh, 30 years ago, roundabout, Python made a review on the alt dots new, but it was at release 0 0.9. I've no idea where the release number came from, but it was clear that Guido had been working on it for some time. The mailing list activity started to grow. People did get it, uh, interested in the language, and external contributors uh, started to arrive. In those days, in fact, a lot of people, uh, their companies weren't prepared to countenance them contributing to open source, so they would, they would sometimes mail patches to Tim Peters, and he would put them in uh, the repository under his name so that nobody's uh, professional integrity was compromised. Um, so yes, in the mid-1990s, oddly enough, at round about the same time as I did, uh, Van Rossum moved over to Reston, Virginia, to join the Center for National Research Initiatives, which was a pretty much a grant-funded organization who, among other things, helped to organize the Internet uh, Engineering Task Force meetings. And uh, he was there working pretty much on, on Python, I think, 
but uh, he also at the time applied for a grant from the National Science Foundation for a programming for everyone proposal and at that point uh, his plans for world domination became clear so um, it was interesting in those days as I say quite coincidentally I myself moved uh, close to Reston Virginia in the mid 1990s and so by complete accident I find myself I found myself um, in the world's center of pythonicity, as you might call it, with uh, Guido just building up his team uh, at CNRI. But it was interesting when um, I, I did finally make contact with the, uh, the Python developers and uh, we hatched plans to start this, this PyCon conference, which was, I guess, when I'd been using Python about five or six years, we started the planning. Um, but by that time, it was very definitely a, a secret weapon. Python was something that people used to gain a, a strategic advantage in, in the, the fast-moving business world. But a lot of people would say when you talk to them about it, yes, but we don't, we don't let people know we're using Python. Uh, like, you know, don't tell everyone. This is, this is our little secret for now. We're the early adopters and we're, we're capitalizing on the advantages of this language. So there were a number of um, small agile startups that built prototypes quite fast. Probably the best known is, is YouTube. And people make some noise about how YouTube, you know, no longer uses it. It's migrated away from Python. Well, of course it has. I mean, nowadays they're at the stage where they can spend 25,000 pounds converting a code base into C. And all of a sudden their, their CPU costs go down by... 60%. Why wouldn't they, they do that kind of thing? But YouTube was initially, as far as I'm aware, built pretty much entirely in Python, which does say quite a bit for the, the language, despite the fact that it was often denigrated as just a scripting language. So yeah, um, this, is, this is typical of the kind of thing that you'd see. So someone in 1995 used Python to build what eventually became one of the world's most successful shipbuilding computer-aided design systems and uh, this was this is his reflection on the experience but basically we see this thing again that you know after some initial experimentation uh, Python had it all um, beautiful language extensible embeddable platform independent and had no license costs so clearly Van Rotten had made some um, very very sensible decisions to lay the foundation for the future success of the language So without wishing to bore you too much with uh, the intervening 25 years, we'll just uh, let time tick by a little and, and just observe the release numbers. So Python, I think 1.0 was out in 1994. I started using Python in uh, 1995 when uh, the 1.4 release was just transitioning to to 1.5, because I think 1997 is the last 1.5 release. I believe the initial one was in 1995, something like that. So Python was actually quite stable. Um, 2.0 was quite an innovation, um, but really the, the reason for the 2.0 release was um, that it, uh, Van Rossum was transitioning from CNRI to another employer and it was realized that the intellectual property rights hadn't really been clarified. And so they made um, a very short-lived release, the 1.6 release. And then that, that was known internally as the, uh, the contractual obligations release uh, to fulfill any obli outstanding obligations they had at CNRI. And then the 2.0 license was effectively a relicensing of the same code base, which allowed us to move on with a clean intellectual property claim. And one of the things I had to do was, uh, during my period as chair in the Python Software Foundation was defend the Python, uh, the Python name in, in various ways. And make sure that various copyrights were eventually transitioned to the foundation. So things went on quite nicely until about 2008. <coughs> Excuse me. And by that time, um, the developers had for a long time been aware of certain warts in the language. So uh, due to the over-reliance on um, 
computer ideas about arithmetic, uh, Python, along with many other programming languages, originally, if you divided an integer by an integer, then you would always get an integer result. The result would be truncated. But uh, Van Rossum felt this wasn't really terribly natural to engineers who were used to working with calculators, and they wanted to see 0 0.75 if they divided um, four by three, sorry, three by what? Four by, no, three by four, good heavens. What happened to my arithmetic? So anyway, that and a number of other features, um, misfeatures as we might call them, really needed to be addressed. The most glaring one of which was that Python's initial implementation had used a byte-oriented string representation, which meant that in order to use Unicode in Python version 2, well, in, in all early versions of, versions of Python, you actually had to take a byte string and encode it into Unicode, but then that then had to be, sorry, to, you had to take a byte string and, and encode it as, as some representation of Unicode. But then you had, all had to store that in a string. So there was never any clear distinction in the language between which strings were binary representations of data and which strings were language dependent uh, Unicode representations of text. And that was a, a distinction that Python 3 made very clearly. And, and making that distinction cost, for example, the, the email library a huge amount of effort because they suddenly realized that they had things which were encoded in bytes that had been represented as Unicode and re-encoded in bytes and all kinds of various representational problems. But it was felt that despite the backward incompatibility that, that the version three introduced, it, it should be introduced for the benefit of the future language. And so 3.0 came out um, just after 2.6, I think, in 2008. And by 2010, uh, 2011, we were up to 3.2. The initial 3.0 release was was never realized, uh, never intended to be anything other than a, a get used to the language feature and and a, a first run through the release process. And it was it very quickly became apparent that there were some performance deficiencies that needed to be rendered. But anyway, uh, by 2010, the core Python development team had said, this is this is 2.7 and we will never be releasing a 2.8. And that was a, a fairly definite mandate. So um, with a certain amount of rebellion on the part of those, some of them who had large code bases and some of them who were just perhaps traditionalists and felt that any change at all was bad. But Python did move on. I myself adopted Python 3 very, very early and by uh, 2010, I was all right. I'd already switched all the courses that I used to teach to, to Python 3 because it seemed like a much better version of the language, basically. But anyway, Python went on until um, version 3.7. And then uh, at this point, I should perhaps explain Python's modified uh, or it's it, the direction of the language is, is determined by a process quite uh, closely parallel to the Internet Engineering Task Force's RFC documentation, where someone will make a proposal, and then there's discussion on that proposal. And if the Python enhancement proposal, or PEP, is accepted, then it becomes part of the language, or part of the infrastructure, or part of whatever part of, of Python uh, it's it's trying to affect. And so uh, this, this proposal called PEP 572 assignment expressions was something that uh, Guido proposed in February 2018, and it, it really did ruffle people's feathers. And it, it wasn't really a terribly, or it didn't seem to me anyway, to be a terribly contentious change uh, to the language. But a lot of people did seem to get very upset that all of a sudden you could be binding variables while you were evaluating an expression. And uh, a certain amount of the discussion, as, as technical discussions can sometimes tend to be, was, shall we say, a little discourteous, perhaps, and uh, pointed uh, remarks that could have been considered uh, abusive, I think, at, at some core developers and so on. And really, when you're developing open source software, nobody wants to, to have to put up with, with that kind of stuff. But just to give you some idea of what we're talking about. I, I'm not going to be throwing a lot of code at you in this uh, talk, so don't worry. But if, if you look at the uh, 
parenthesized expression in the first if statement there, you can see that this, this solved a long-term problem with Python because as an assignment, as a statement-based language, Python forced you to evaluate something and then test its value if you needed to keep it. So since in, in the particular case of pattern matching on, on strings, if you had a pattern and the search failed, then it would return a result of none, which is an object that has no methods. You can't call it its methods. So until we introduced the the walrus operator, so-called, well, think of it as a smile, and you'll probably see why they call it the walrus operator. Uh, but yeah, before the ability to bind that name match to the result during the evaluation of the expression was available, <clears throat> we would first of all have to say match equals, we'd have to assign that as a separate statement and then say, if match is not none. So it was just a, a relatively trivial way to simplify the expression of certain computations. Same thing in a while example there. You can see that uh, what we're doing is we're reading a file 8,000, well, eight kilobytes at a time, and we're buying that name to chunk. So if there's a chunk, because in, in Python, an empty string is, is a falsy value. It's, it hasn't got a truth value, it's a false value. So in other words, if it is empty, it has stopped yielding uh, useful information. You've got to the end of it so you can stop. Uh, but of course, if it's not, then you've now captured the result of the read-in chunk, and so you can process the chunk and continue to iterate around the while loop. And that that solves another little irksome problem. You know, it, it's not the kind of thing that will stop you from using a language, but it's the kind of thing you get awfully tired of having written for the hundredth time. So, and again, obviously, if you have an expensive value to compute and you want to reuse it, then in this case, we're creating a list of uh, cubes and uh, squares, then you can actually capture the result in the first sub-expression and then use that bound variable in the subsequent sub-expressions to avoid uh, a repetition or multiple repetitions of the, the relatively expensive function. And there are other things like that, but basically it, it didn't seem to me anyway like too contentious a proposal, but nevertheless, um, <clears throat> you know, people people do get very heated. Some you'd, you'd think the way some people behave, programming languages were were religions. Uh, but anyway, whatever. Um, it it appeared that that Van Rossum had by this stage uh, decided that perhaps being the benefactor of of uh, this language for life wasn't necessarily what he wanted to dedicate the rest of his life to. So um, after some cogitation, after the, in fact, the day after the, um, the, the enhancement proposal was finally accepted, he sent an email to the Python committers group, basically simply expressing that um, he, he, you know, he'd had enough. It was, it was not at all an emotional message. And when you think about it, I think Guido and I are, are very much of an age. He's probably, you know, he'd be like me. He's thinking, well, you know, after all this time doing what I've been doing, do I really need to uh, devote any more time to, to a process which is clearly capable of uh, running on its own? And, uh, you know, a little reminder there that uh, there's a bus lurking around. In other words, Python, essentially with a benevolent dictator for life, had a bus number of one. Uh, if one person got run over by a bus, the project, well, it wouldn't have been dead, but it, it would have been in disarray. So he's thinking as well about the future of the language. But the way that he ended it off was by saying, effectively, day-to-day -day operations are, are proceeding. It's uh, not often that he has to, to intervene on those. So, as long as we know how uh, the Python enhancement propos proposals will be decided, and as long as we can arrange for continuity of the development community by, by continuing to induct new people, then uh, you know maybe something will happen. Uh, but the catch at the end, he said, was I'm, I'm going to try and let you all, the current committers to the language, the people who really control its technical direction, figure it out for yourselves. This was actually interestingly reminiscent 
unfortunately, I chose to um, to leave PyCon because when I I ran PyCon for the first year, and then I ran it for the second year, and I said I'm I'll do one more year, and after that somebody else can do it. And at the end of the third year, I was asked, you know, where who where is it going to be next year? And I said I don't know. Why not? Well, because I said last year I was only going to do three, and this is my third. So uh, it's up to you lot now. And fortunately, the the Python community did come through. So this was kind of an extension of the same sort of thing. Although interestingly enough, it was only when I um, started to prepare this talk that I, I realized that that parallel existed. So anyway, as uh, Python people will tend to do, they tried to solve this problem by writing a Python Emperor proposal, which effectively became a proposal for how the, the Python language itself uh, should be governed. And you can, I've tried to put links in for these things. I don't know whether they're all there, but you, you, know, you can certainly find uh, any Python enhancement proposal relatively easily. And it turned out there was an, an interestingly high number of different ways that the community collectively thought that it might be possible to, to govern the, the Python community. I should mention as well, probably, um, that as... Uh, someone who's contributed to more to the Python Software Foundation than the, the community, which is the, the Software Foundation primarily exists to protect the intellectual property, uh, property in the language and to, to grow and uh, support the, the international Python community. But I've, I've never, uh, there's never been any point at which the Python Software Foundation has felt either the need or the or indeed the qualification to to direct the future of the language so the python software foundation has no no interest in the development direction of the language it's there purely to support it and the the community around it but anyway i mean they they do offer services like helping to run elections and the tedious administrivia that technical people tend to be less good at shall we say so anyway, yeah, there were these, um, was it nine, eight, nine different proposals uh, put forward and quite extensive periods of discussion. <clears throat> so if you actually went, you can look at the git commit history of the different proposals and see how they developed. And for some of them, it, it can be quite interesting, but only, I suppose, if you've got an interest in <clears throat> internet archaeology at this stage. So anyway, the, the, there were... Four most, the, the four most popular proposals were, uh, were the ones I thought I'd, I'd focus on. So organization by community was uh, the proposal that came forth in this list. And that was basically uh, a fairly detailed proposal about how the root and branch activities of the Python community should be overseen by a team of, of five core developers. And I think its weaknesses principally were that they were asking a lot of five people to be able to organize something of, of that scope and breadth. And I think the voters probably recognized that. Um, did I mention the voting community was it everyone who had commit rights to the, to the Python language repository? So the, the third most popular solution was uh, a trio of Python developers, which effectively simply replaced um, the single Guido van Rossum by a triumvirate, which at least you know, then you've got majority voting, I suppose. But of course, it re retained all the administrative disadvantages of centralization, which had they asked Van Rossum, I think he would have suggested you know, they might find the workload a little too high. Interestingly, one of the things that the outgoing, uh, an outgoing member of the um, the founding founding steering committee said was, I had no idea, you know, like the amount of work that uh, Guido had been getting through. It's how he did the, the work that five of us have been doing. I have no idea. Also had the odd feature that if somebody left, then all three had to be re-elected. So it, it seemed a little impractical to me, but it was obviously quite popular to come third. And then community governance, which was a, a bit more interesting. It was, it was less prescriptive, I suppose, than the organization of the Python community. But it still had this feature that basically people had to kind of register interests as experts. And there was a, a voting scheme which, which didn't seem to me to be um, terribly practical. 
So what the community eventually decided to go for was the, the so-called steering council model. And there is a link to the PEP in the slides there if you, if you want to look at them later. Um, but yeah, basically somebody said earlier in, in the evening that you know, Python is, is boring. And that is indeed one of its design features. Um, yeah, Python is not a surprising language, and that's why people like it so much, because you know who likes surprises? So it, it, it's a fairly straightforward language to use, even for relative beginners. But it, it, so was the governance model that was adopted. So the rationale was basically um, we're in what externally might look like a crisis. I mean, nobody was terribly worried inside the Python community, but obviously the technical press are out on the wings saying, oh, Van Rossum has left the Python project, blah, blah, blah. Um, but this is not now a time to be looking for innovations in open source management. Let's, let's do something that we know pretty much will work. Let's keep it as simple as we can. So in other words, the, I think the phrase they used was a minimum viable uh, governance. Let's, let's give it fairly broad reaching powers. Let's give it comprehensive scope because we don't want to have to come back and reorganize because it can't do what it wants to do because it's too limited by constitutional matters or whatever. And, and let's make it easy. Let's, let's make it flexible. Let, let's avoid trying to put too much loading on people leading to burnout, which has been a, a problem in many technical development communities in the open source world. Uh, and let's allow ourselves to, to adjust in the light of experience. So uh, that was decided. And part of the proposal was that uh, every time Python brought out a new feature release, a new council should be elected. So I suppose if I wanted you to just take away one thing from this talk, the thing that I'd have you take away is that Python, the Python community has actually consciously addressed the problem of the bus number. And it's, it's taken steps to distribute responsibility. So our bus number is now five, I suppose. And it's not perhaps a groundbreaking innovation, but it does indicate a certain degree of thought about the future of the language, which is obviously very important to the large number of people um, who are increasingly using Python. I was stunned. I, I discovered that Python is rising way up in the popularity ranks. I don't know where it stands in the Kiobi index now, but it must be doing pretty well. Excuse me a second. <clears throat> so the elections were held in January 2019. The governance document having been, <clears throat> excuse me, updated, and there was actually a very, uh, very good field. Seventeen people stood for the election. And uh, we have a, a fairly sophisticated election procedure. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> In the Python Software Foundation. So <coughs> you, I do <coughs> apologize. Just give me a second. Python holds third place in the TOB index. I beg your pardon? Python holds thir third place in the TOB index. Ah, thank you very much indeed. I've po posted the link in the public chat. Excellent, wonderful. Thanks very much, Kuhn. So, yes, you, you may recognize one of the names um, in the first steering committee, because as it happened, all five people who were elected were long-term members of the Python development community. That was, that was more or less inevitable. But I thought the, the interesting thing was that Guido van Rossum felt uh, able to stand in that process. I mean, it was hardly surprising, I think, that he was elected. But um, 
it was an indication, I think, as well. It was a smart move because it signaled to the community that, that Guido van Rossum regarded himself as only having the authority delegated to him by the community rather than now being the person who was responsible for controlling the direction, the future, and indeed the very lifeblood of the language. And after all, the guy's done it for 30 years, so it, it's you know, a bit a, time to give him a bit of a break. So, um, did the world turn upside down? Well, not really. Um, no, not at all. Uh, the main principles that the steering committee had adopted were to adopt broad powers and use them uh, pretty much as sparingly as it, as it could. And that's more or less what's happened. Um, the steering council has four main things to do. Uh, the Python enhancement proposals have to be processed. It has to update the, the code of conduct and, and keep it enforced, which it does. There's a, a code of conduct subcommittee. It works with the foundation, which is responsible for, for maintaining and managing the project assets, handles the business of providing infrastructure and so on. And it, it delegates some authority to, to various other subcommittees as well. And the, it, it's a fairly, a fairly well-oiled machine even before the steering committee came along. So nothing changed radically. The, the steering committee has settled down, settled down fairly quickly indeed in its first weeks to uh, regular one hour meetings, which were focused on the, the various different aspects of the work. And they processed meetings through a private GitHub repository. So people who couldn't attend a meeting were able to make uh, comments on the agenda in advance and so on and that all seemed to work um fairly well some major initiatives that they took including included appointing a project manager to ensure that when python 2 transitioned to end of life people had options um unless they chose to ignore them at least um that that uh, the issue tracking system should be migrated to github which seems like a fairly bold step given that the python community has as long as i can remember used um, uh, uh, fairly antiquated now, I guess, uh, bug tracking system that still seems to do the job. And also they've, they've offered support for uh, the work group on Python package, that should have been packaging, sorry about the typo, um, Python packaging work group. And uh, effectively, the community had already helped itself towards releasing Guido by adopting a, the idea that in a, a Initially, all Python enhancements proposals required what was called the BDFL pronouncement about whether they were accepted or not. So they had a couple of years, I think, at least before the elections were held. They'd adopted this scheme that uh, it didn't have to be Van Rossum. It could have been somebody else, which uh, he delegated, or indeed sometimes somebody else would nominate and he would simply approve. So the process on enhancement proposals didn't really need to to change all well, and there were quite a number of enhancement proposals these are just some of them that 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 come to mind that by no means all of them and we'll get to the pattern matching um in a short while but basically python enhancements seem to go well uh, there was one major conduct code, code of conduct uh, enforcement that i can remember but basically that was brought up at the uh, the result of the um the code of conduct working group and the the steering council simply chose to i think to follow their recommendations but it, it's always painful when somebody who has to be excluded particularly when it was somebody who was acknowledged to be a, a very capable uh, developer so a couple of quotes uh, that i didn't bother to format properly sorry about that uh, from members of the steering council in the first year um, basically, the first year they, they did manage to stick to their agenda and they collaborated well. And uh, interestingly, Barry Warsaw said, uh, some, we, we discovered that the governance peps didn't really cover a lot of things. Well, from my own experience, um, slinging text for the constitution of the Python Software Foundation, I'm not the least bit surprised to find that a governance document was incomplete when it was adopted. But anyway,
uh, as he pointed out, that meant that they they did spend quite a lot of effort trying to figure out the process for some of the things that they accepted responsibility for. So, yeah, um, Van Rossum's own verdict on his, his first year in the steering council, um, he said before uh, before the, yeah, I didn't really make the, the context obvious here, but the first quote is before the steering council. And he said there, whenever any controversy arose, it eventually escalated to him. And of course it's stressful, yes. And uh, I know from my experience in the, uh, in the stress industry, that the the most um, damaging kind of stress is the stress that that's repeatedly applied without sufficient chance to to de-stress. And yeah, voting, he said, after the election creates a different relationship with the developers. So basically, he's there for the developers now, um, in a supportive sense rather than than in a dictatorial sense. Um, but he did find after the the first year. Um, where he, he was on the, the steering council. He found it was stressful. And um, although he, he did initially nominate himself for a second term, um, he discussed it with, with other members and it turned out there was a, a very adequate slate of candidates. So he felt able to stand back and, and leave the steering council to uh, get on with its work. And the pattern matching proposals that I, I mentioned when I was going through PEPs played their role in that. So anyway, the, the second steering council came along with the release of, I think it was Python 3.8, and so uh, you will notice that there are only two new names, Warsaw Cannon and Willing were, were carried through. Uh, so Thomas Wouters, I think he, Thomas Wouters, he might pronounce his name, it's as close as I can get to the Dutch anyway, and Victor Stinner, who's um, a member from uh, France, I think he, he lives in, they uh, both joined the steering council and um, the second steering second steering council was was fairly uneventful except right at the end of their uh, term there was this uh, controversy about proposals to incorporate structural pattern matching into the language and i won't even go into the technical ins and outs of it, suffice it to say that it's a, a major new feature in the language, but it doesn't hardly alter the, I don't think it alters the existing language at all. Python's very strict now about backwards compatibility. So again, there's been this kind of free for all where uh, ill-informed people such as myself take part in, in technical discussions on an almost religious basis. Uh, opinions are divided, people make counter proposals, they try to modify the PEPs, one proposal. Anyway, the, there was initially one rather long and, and badly structured proposal, which eventually became three different enhancement proposals. And an enormous amount of effort was spent in discussion. So uh, eventually the steering council had to resolve whether or not these uh, proposals were to be accepted. And they said, well, we're actually going to leave it to the next steering council. Which was OK, because it, it sort of cooled the air a bit. There was this clearing, clearing off, cooling off period um, before any action was taken. But ironically, when the third steering council appeared, four of its members were had been members of the second steering council, and so the only new member introduced was uh, Pablo. I can't, I can't quite. I think Pablo's based in London, but I'm not absolutely sure. So anyway, we're we're on to our our third steering council now, and I was going to put some notes in about my own view, but I figured, well, this talks long enough anyway, and if you want my view you can ask for it. So I suppose the final thought is that I wouldn't say that, that Python has um, reached any kind of organizational nirvana, but they've, they've managed to find a pragmatic way forward that continues to work, continues to protect the intellectual property in the language, continues to use a relatively democratic method of determining its future and and it should also be mentioned a fair degree of transparency so i said to uh, i guido told me he'd been invited to the meeting but unfortunately he had something 
more interesting to do. Um, well, you can't blame them. Um, if I had the chance to go out with the, the one I loved instead of listening to me talk, then I probably wouldn't be listening to me talk now. But he did ask me to, uh, to pass on his best regards to the group. So I've, I've done that. And I think uh, that's probably about all I've got to say, except to point out that I have not uh, clearly completed editing the last slide yet. <laughs> and I will, will do so at leisure afterwards. I think the link was on the, the first slide. So there we go. Cheers. Cheers. I must say you're very punctual, actually. Thank you. Um, so we have lots of time for questions also. Yeah. Um, so feel free to ask questions. How does this work? Do the questions come in on a chat board or do people just shout them out or? Yeah, Good. as long as not everybody shouts at the same time, <laughs> then uh, okay. we'll be fine. Uh, and I can read out some of the questions from the chat. So, uh, um, yes, go ahead. The first thing that I see there is what is the relation to MicroPython? Um, well, MicroPython is a more or less complete implementation of Python version 3.4. Uh, which has no formal relationship at all, as far as I'm aware, with the, the Python Software Foundation. It, its founder clearly is a very capable programmer because I've, I've used Python, uh, MicroPython myself, and it, it's a very faithful implementation of the language insofar as you can implement something as complex as Python on something as, as simple as a, a microcontroller. But it, it really did um, extend Python's scope. Now, I... I think actually there is, um, do I have it in this deck? Yes. There is, in fact, um, a few bonus links at the end of the talk just for people who are interested in these things. And uh, the third list on the third item on that list, Python, it, it, that's a talk I gave uh, to a conference in Greece, basically pointing out one of Python's great features was that it was scalable from such tiny architectures right up to amazing microcomputers. But there's no formal relationship except that the implementers have been faithful to the 3.4 standard insofar as was possible given the architectural limitations of the hardware. Uh, I see another question here. Would there ever be a Python 4? And why or why not? Um, not too... Yes, yes, there, there probably will is the answer. But uh, the disappointing part about it is it's, it's not likely to be anything revolutionary. Um, effectively, Python is, is seen to be on an evolutionary path forwards from now on. I think the, the transition from 2.0, no, Python 2 to Python 3 was a, was a very brave one. And I think it caused sufficient turbulence in the Python community that nobody is at all anxious to, to repeat the experience. Interestingly, um, quite a long time ago, I heard Guido van Rossum say that um, version numbers should never go above one digit because you couldn't really tell whether 2.10 meant 2.1.0 or 2.10. Uh, but I believe the next release of Python is 3.10. So when 4.0 will come along, I honestly don't know. But I can't imagine it will be. It will be even as large as the difference between between Python 2 and Python 3. Ah, is it sort of an extension of this question? Yep. Have you ever feared that Python would end end up dead after the lack of backward compatibility of 3.x versus 2.x? Uh, personally, I've, I've never had any doubt at all that, that Python 3 was the future, although I do have sympathy for people who invested in Python early. 
and ended up with with large uh, Python 2.x code bases, which they are unable to port. But I mean, let's be honest about it. This is this is the computer world, and if if you're not prepared to cope with change, then you'll just have to put up with the the consequences, I suppose. I mean, the the Python 2 to Python 3 change was not undertaken lightly. And even though it wasn't undertaken likely, I think that the strength of the reaction in some areas did take the, the development community uh, somewhat by surprise. I think the transition was, was underprepared, which, which didn't really help. Um, and that's, I think, largely a matter of being an open source development community that, you know, we're not really, it doesn't have a marketing team, it doesn't have a, a project manager to think about these things really. It's just a bunch of programmers trying to get a product out, and so they they did the best they could. But I think, let's just say, in in customer relations terms, the transition to Python three wasn't wasn't terribly well handled. Anyone else wants to let their voice be heard? If it's me talking all the time, it's much more interesting to have some other tone of voice. Any people angry about Python here? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <clears throat> right, maybe nobody really cares about Python, but we can yeah, we can talk about anything in my fifty year career if you want. I know. Oh, nice. Quite happy to answer more general questions. I have a question. There there is a recent uptake in uh, Python, as mm -hmm. you can see from the to your uh, index. So, what what is the what is the reason you think that it's it's becoming more popular? Um, I think that's that's well. Obviously, there are many. There's not just one reason, but I think the two most compelling ones are one. It's it's attractive usability as a language. It's very approachable, which has helped it to achieve popularity among all kinds of different technical commu technical communities. And the other is the the breadth of application, which is covered by the many, many libraries and, and packages now available, plus advanced features like the, the, the NumPy package, for example. I mean, that encapsulates about 40 years of numerical computational skill and makes it readily available in, in a language where, while, you know, you, you're running maybe you're running fairly low speed glue logic but the computations themselves i mean some of them are based on fortran algorithms optimized for 35 years so it's um it's just it's huge range of applicability plus the fact that if if you've got a good object oriented library for some given task then it's relatively easy to a, a fairly inexperienced programmer how to tell Python to, to get these things done. Thank you. Pleasure. Interesting question. I think our crowd is very polite today. They're not normally as polite as they are today. Oh, Everybody's they can me. I, I don't care. Speaking in turn. Uh, I have a question too. Yeah. Uh, what feature or property do you think is still missing from Python? Ah. Um. Good question. I personally think that the the languages. I mean, I'm. I. I suppose I'm a a bit of a luddite in some respects because. I think the language has, has already gone far enough. Um, the development team worked very hard to put asynchronous computational features into the language, which I, I personally don't see a compelling need for. Um, but at the same time, I have to acknowledge that you know, my own perceptions of, of Python's user base are biased by the kind of applications I'm personally knowledgeable about and interested in. So. I think Python will continue to to add features which increase its its um, range of applicability. I don't think there's necessarily a guarantee that the new features that are added will be as broadly applicable as the as the base features of the language. But that's 
that's hardly unique in the development of any programming language, really. So Python is probably special in that respect. I have another question. What, what is your uh, second favorite programming language besides oh, Python? No. <laughs> that's that's an, a very interesting question. I suppose I, I do have a certain fondness for Simula, which was one of the, uh, that was pretty much the first object-oriented language I, I ever got my hands on. Um, I liked a language called Icon very much, and in fact, one of the reasons I liked Python was because I'd, I'd been using Icon extensively, and Python's um, model for namespaces was very, very close to what Icon had, as was its its method of um, allocating everything, all, all data items were allocated from the, from the heap, which was an interesting difference in those days. So yeah, those kinds of languages, Snowball, Icon, I suppose. Um, I did, I mean, I've done interesting programming work in, in quite a lot of different languages now. So I don't really think I have a second favorite. Like when, once Python came along, I thought, well, that's it now. You know, I don't, I don't really need to use any other programming languages. And, and as it happens, that, that's more or less turned out to be right, because even with my interest in hardware, and I've been a, a lifelong hardware engineering devotee of a, a kind of amateur nature, I've never really done any professional hardware engineering, but even that interest now, you know, I mean, I can write interrupt handling routines in Python for Pete's sake, so why would I want any other language? But again, my needs are not the needs of the universe and so there will other be other people forcing the uh, the language in other directions which i may not be interested in but i'm sure lots of other people will be anyone else that's no but uh, that's that's interesting uh, interrupts in python handling interrupts so oh. do you think it's feasible to do uh, kernel modules in python for example <laughs> i don't think i'd recommend that no no i mean the the kernel the kernel the idea you're talking about the linux kernel presumably yeah um the kernel is a fairly uh a fairly tight architecture. I think Python, introducing Python into that environment, <coughs> excuse me, it might it might be a little bit sloppy given, you know, that Python is a, a language with no deterministic memory management, that kind of stuff. You really don't want your kernel processes stopping for two milliseconds to garbage collect while they're running a bit of Python. Although have, it has to be said, I mean, the garbage collection is not a feature of the language. So if someone comes up with an implementation that has really fast garbage collection or doesn't use garbage collection, possibly so. But I'm I'm personally not a great believer in pushing things in, in directions that it, they're not comfortable in going. I think that would be an abuse of Python almost. I have a bit of a different uh, question. You've been mm -hmm. talking a lot about the object-oriented aspect of Python. Uh, yeah. And now there seems to be a bit of a resurgence coming up for functional programming. Is yeah. Python doing, doing anything in that direction? Um, no, Python, in fact, is, has, if anything, become less functional. So uh, there don't seem to be any moves to incorporate functional aspects into the language. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that the so many Python computations are based on the idea of mutable state that to go to a functional environment would seem artificial to many Python users. I, I'm, there are doubtless ways that one could find to express algorithms functionally in Python, but such ways wouldn't be using the full breadth of the language. And so therefore, if I wanted to do functional programming, I'd probably find it more appropriate to use a language that had been designed with that in mind. 
Having said Good. which, of course, Python does have its own little formal aspects as well. One of uh, Van Rossum's side projects while he was at um, Dropbox was, uh, I mean, a feature I didn't mention about the languages is we, we introduced type uh, annotations some time ago so that we could make assertions about the value, the, the range of the types of value or the, the domains that the various input parameters to functions and so on. Uh, could have. Now, Python is not a language that's actually uh, amenable to static type checking because it's a very dynamic language, but uh, you can use static type checking uh, techniques on these assertions. So, I mean, do, do, we're not at the, Python's not, not at the stage where it, it's trying to sort of reject all formality. It's just that it, it fits some techniques better than others, and functional programming has just never been an area that's had a great deal of concentration in the Python world, I don't think. Okay, I guess that it's time to just close the formal part. Uh, give everybody a chance to uh, um, pour yourself a glass of whatever. Probably something strong. Uh, let's try, because last time we tried to do that applause, but it's very hard to do it uh, synchronously. So let's all unmute and try to do the applause and break the free switch audio server on the server. <laughs> <laughs> Works quite nice. Thank you very much. Yes, I thought okay. there'd be a lot more echo than that. <laughs>